And in particular, you know, the National Cooperative Business Association has or used to have a motto where it say, co-ops make better citizens. And mm -hmm. the idea being that when people truly participate as co-owners of an enterprise through some sort of some sort of co-op, economic democracy or workplace democracy, it r requires them to think bigger, right? It requires them to think um, in more strategic terms about the economy overall. And it tends to make people more engaged in the economy overall. And that quite naturally, since these are rank and file people usually, they tend to think more through a justice and sustainability lens. What does fair economics look like? What does fair commerce look like? look like right and so so a lot of us are from, from the geo side of things are looking at you know the the beneficial cultural developments that happen when people are engaged with economic democracies and especially workplace democracies but i'm wondering you know how much skepticism do you get or have you had in-depth conversations your you or your organization had in-depth conversations with impact investors about actual economic democracy and workplace yeah. democracy because those are things that still a lot of highly placed people are skeptical about those things and so i'm just curious as to any you know how those conversations might have gone for you if you've had them yeah um so it's interesting because when we're talking about economic democracy and workplace democracy I think sometimes the elephant in the room is we're also like that power doesn't just come from nowhere that's given to workers. That's power that's typically in the hands of external investor shareholders, right? So this is part of the, the tricky nature of trying to get more capital actors to finance this, this movement is at least for some kinds of investors, it's saying, hey, instead of investing in businesses that you could have, you know, ownership over, think of the traditional venture capital model where, uh, you know, you put equity into a company, you have voting, uh, you know, voting percentage, you own a piece of the company, and then years down the line, you sell that piece, hoping to, that the company grows in the meantime, and you make a profit off of that share. When we were thinking about uh, businesses that do economic democracy in a deep way, that's off the table. So on many levels, we're saying to investors, hey, let's we're, we're going to take away some of your power because it's more fair and more equitable to workers. Um, that's not to say there aren't investors who are interested in doing that. And I think it's important to acknowledge that there are some really, really amazing partners um, in the finance world who are down to figure out, okay, how do we make these models work? Um, so in the cooperative space, we have a lot of uh, loan funds and CDFIs, uh, community development financial institutions that are specifically designed to lend to co-ops to help businesses convert from traditional uh, enterprise forms to co-ops um, and other forms of employee ownership like ESOPs. Um, and I think it's really important to, to acknowledge uh, those those types of investors. Um, where we have really been looking uh, more so these days uh, is at that fund and intermediary level, um, because a lot of the work that's happening in the field, not just co-ops, but other alternative business forms. Um, so uh, just to name a few like ESOPs, employee stock ownership plans, um, employee ownership trusts are a new emerging form of employee ownership that use a perpetual purpose trust, uh, which is uh, a legal tool to seal the purpose of a company uh, within this external body that makes governance decisions over the company. And there's lots of different ways to use those perpetual purpose trusts. Um, and then there's also lots of new, exciting and interesting and untested forms of employee ownership and other stakeholder ownership being created, like holding companies of cooperatives. There's a few, uh, there's a few of those out there. Um, there's partial models that are granting some shares, some shares over time, um, that are doing, doing old, old things in new ways, um, in order to, to get around some of the barriers to capital. 
Um, but within within all these uh, models, there's intermediaries and funds that are collecting money from asset owners like foundations, uh, high net worth individuals, um, family offices, and then and then doing the investments into businesses themselves. When we look at that fund level, that's where I think we get some of the interesting questions around, okay, who's investing and who's not. Uh, you get a lot of the very progressive uh, young people who have access to family wealth now. Um, some of the progressive foundations and family offices have new leadership uh, that are interested in economic democracy and uh, deep racial and economic justice and seeing economic democracy as a tool for that. Um, but a lot of the money that's coming in is because of individuals' journeys, own personal journeys within those institutions or with their own money and convincing the trustees or whomever is uh, in decision-making roles at those financial institutions to invest in these funds that are in turn investing in the, um, the alternative uh, ownership model. Um, so I, I think this is a very long-winded perhaps uh, answer to your question, but um, I think we ha currently have uh, a, a slice of investors who are really interested in economic democracy and see the transformative potential of these models. And I think there's an even bigger slice of investors who could be in that group, but have not been exposed to it uh, or are maybe risk, risk averse and are not uh, comfortable learning about these new models and the funds that are investing them uh, and just need a little bit of support, education, awareness building to, to actually get there. So that's one of the roles that Transform Finance is trying to take in the field is to try to add to the investors that are doing that. Um, but then I think there's this whole exciting new uh area of innovation around developing financial products and new vehicles to get new sources of capital altogether uh, into this space. Um, and a lot of the conversations I'm having are uh, sounding like, how do we get CDFIs, community development financial institution capital into this space? Because there's a lot of debt capital that they could provide um, to go alongside the fund investments to do conversions. Um, how do we get government money? You know, there's new uh, federal dollars coming down the pipeline with um, the uh, IRA, um, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund is a part of that too, to have a, a there's a climate element to some of this. The um, SSBCI, which is an acronym I always forget the name of, sorry. <laughs> um, so there's all these tools and, and I think we're at this moment of, of the field of folks who are, you know, building co-ops and other uh, alternative business forms of saying, okay, we've learned a lot. Uh, we have good infrastructure for some kinds of business creation, but you know, it's clearly not enough if we're going to transform the economy. How do we really unlock even more capital to this space? Um, and there's a lot of really exciting conversations happening. This is great. I totally have a question about this. I, um, I'm a member of the Colorado Solidarity Fund, which, and I think you know Nathan Schneider and Jason Weiner and other folks, they have a video on the, on the website. Um, so they're also members of that fund. It's just an investment club, it's small. We're talking tiny amounts of money and not a ton of people. Um, but I was just thinking to myself like, huh, why am I, why do I do that, right? And I think the explanation on my side is um, I can't afford to just give grants. I don't have enough money to be giving people grants. On the other hand, I do want to support people's work. So these investments are at such a low rate of return and on such, you know, generous terms that uh, it's a way, it's like the next best thing to giving a grant for somebody who can't afford to give a grant. So that's kind of, that, that'd be, that would be sort of my motivation as an investor in that scenario. Um, but I think when it comes to the question of larger investors, I guess my question is sort of why, why are these folks not just making grants if they've got big money? And if they don't 
so yeah, that would be one question. Like, why not just make, why not use grant funding? And then the second thing, because I, so I guess my question would be, well, if you're not, it's not for the returns, because it's not going to be a big return. So what's the control, like control would only, the only thing I could conceive of would be to be some control element or some, you know, like with a grant, I have a friend who inherited some money. He set up a foundation and his print concept was in 10 years, all the money needs to be gone. Mm -hmm. So he kind of did it so that he organized himself out of that wealth. But it's, so I'm wondering kind of like, this doesn't seem like people are intending to disappear as investors, right? They're not intending to give away all their money. So what's the, I'm a little bit kind of curious, what's in it for them? <laughs> That's what I would say. Other than good, you know, good things and nice things that we'd like to see happen in the world, which of course that's all that's all good. But I'm curious about the economic concept. Yeah, I mean, for the investors who are currently putting their money into uh, the alternative ownership space, whether that's through a fund um, like Seed Commons is uh, a fund that invests in co-ops, uh, those place-based uh, CDFI lenders that I mentioned. Um, I think I think that last point you made is is probably the main reason they want to do good in the world and they actually see co-ops and economic democracy as a as a good way to do that. Um, but I think your first question is actually interrelated here. I think why they make an investment over a grant is the same as as you. They want to continue to you know be able to deploy capital going forward. Um, you know, there's there's only so so many grants that uh, someone can give before they're out of money, right? Um, and this is kind of the idea behind the way foundations are structured. Um, if you're familiar, they only give five percent of their money away uh, annually as grants. The other ninety five is invested to grow their endowment. This is the typical foundation structure to grow their endowment so they can you know theoretically make more grants in the future. Now, I think the interesting, you know, theoretical, ethical questions come in there where it's like, you know, well, 5% is a, is a law, they have to do that. But they could do more, um, or they could do different kinds of investments, right? Like, um, you know, if you, you say a market rate, and I use quotes because there is really no market rate, but if a market rate investment is say like 7 8% return, uh, and a grant is a negative 100% return. Uh, there's a big range in between there. Uh, and there's a lot of capital products and tools that will get you somewhere in there. Um, you know, when we were talking about investors who are really thinking um, concessionary and really, you know, putting the impact first that are getting returned, like these are not grant makers, we're still talking like, you know, zero to 3% uh as kind of like the the baseline like if an investor is making that you're like we're not even beating inflation in these days uh but that money is still cycled back and you can still uh redeploy that in the future and that concessionary capital is very important to all of all of the uh businesses and funds that we're talking about here uh especially because it allows more market rate investors to come in and say okay there's a chunk that's you know at this cheaper end zero to three, I can come in at five to seven and say, um, this is very loose math, but that, that concept does happen a lot. Uh, but what's, what's interesting in, in this is I think to really like reconsider, you know, what even a loss looks like, um, especially if you're say someone like your friend who sets up a foundation and, uh, you know, is saying, I want this money eventually to go deploy. I'm not trying to grow in perpetuity. You, know, you could sit, consider um, things like recoverable grants, which uh, are kind of structured like, like a loan, but if um, the loan, but the loan could be forgiven and it's considered a grant, um, you know, and that kind of places your expected return somewhere between negative 100 and zero, right? Um, and, you know, I think there's interesting ways to think about it um, that's not so binary. Uh, and this is also simultaneously a call for foundations as, you know, some of the financial actors that are best positioned to support economic democracy and alternative ownership enterprises. Um, they 
I think can and should be more creative in the kinds of financing they're willing to, to give out. Um, and that's really because there's just this mentality and philanthropy to grow the endowment in perpetuity. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really surprising sometimes even, um, you know, the folks who work at an endowment on the mission investment sides, you know, they're looking for impactful deals. Some of the funds that we are talking about here, the seed commons, uh, Apis and heritage, which is a, an ESOP conversion fund focused on racial equity, you know, even some of these really impactful, uh, funds are not fitting the criteria of the mission investors because it's either not enough or, you know, there's a, I think a mismatch uh, on the risk return profile that they're looking for. Um, and one addendum on that is, which I think is really important, is a lot of the risks that investors perceive in this space are not actually there. Like you're not all the time just giving your money to, you know, a bunch of anarchists or whatever. <laughs> like a lot of these are very financially sound. There's tons of evidence that uh, that shared ownership, co-ops, ESOPs, other forms of worker ownership are actually very sound investments. They're more resilient in the face of economic crises. There's productivity gains uh, that companies have when they convert to worker ownership. And that's not the first argument that I like to make personally when I'm advocating for these models, but there's evidence there that shows that these are actually, uh, can, they can be sound. Um, and that's not to uh, uh, underestimate the costs that come with converting businesses, which is usually how finance gets involved. Um, you know, you're probably not going to make as much as if you were to invest in, say, like private equity. Um, but if you're doing that kind of investment, you're not you're not you're not equating that in the same in the same bucket.